I'm so excited for today's show. Uh, today's guest um, has been an inspiration to me and an inspiration to millions of people, uh, including researchers, um, many the, uh, the likes of which have followed in the path of today's guest and uh, have um, been able to share much uh, enlightenment with people in terms of astrotheology and um, sovereignty. And uh, it's my honour, I'm excited, it's my honour and privilege to welcome today Jordan Maxwell to the show. Welcome, Jordan. Well, thank you, Santos. Always happy to be able to talk with you, for sure. So, <clears throat> it's been a long road, a long, difficult road, but I guess we're both still here. Yep, and um, and uh, will most of the listeners will be thankful for that. You've devoted uh, at least fifty, if not sixty, years of your life to uh, uncovering the the subject of astrotheology, and what a subject that is. Yeah, it certainly is. I mean, it's an incredible uh, subject. That uh, and the thing that's most unbelievable about it is how many people have no idea about it. It's sitting right in front of you. and uh, But it just proves that how the mind, the human mind, can be deceived. And uh, it's just an extraordinary story of betrayal of the human family, uh, being lied to and deceived. And uh, so I, I realized this a long time ago when I was nine years old. I'm 71 now, but when I was nine years old, I was um, uh, confirmed Catholic Church. My family is a very big Catholic family in town, and we were told the day before in Catholic school, we were told that uh, by the nuns that tomorrow night after the service, confirmation service is over, the bishop might want to uh, ask the children if they have any questions. <clears throat> and so if, if that happens, we were told, do not ask any questions, period. Just sit quiet. And uh, so that night, uh, after the service was over, Bishop T.J. Tulin from Alabama, he was there, and, and he said just that. He said, uh, if any of your children have any questions, I'll try and answer them. And so I stood up, and everyone, all the kids knew, you're not supposed to do that. So I stood up, and I asked him, I said, my father works with the torches, like a welder. I said, if there was an angel next to me, could I take a torch? <clears throat> and burn an angel, would it hurt him? And he kind of looked at me funny and said, no, of course not. And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, fire is a something to the effect, he said, does fire is, is a natural phenomenon. You, you know, you have to have wood or paper or plastic or something. You can't burn an angel. And I said, why can't you burn an angel? And he said, because angels are spirits. You can't burn a spirit. And I said, well, then why am I worried about going to hell when my spirit will burn forever if you can't burn a spirit? And uh, <laughs> everyone in the church just sat quiet. No one had ever thought about that, you know, that clever as, a, as an eight or nine year old. And uh, it, it became uh, you know obvious to me that the bishop did not have any kind uh, of uh, answer for that. And nobody else has. And so it started me on a road to asking questions. That's all. And uh, you'd be surprised how many people don't ask questions. And the reason why is because they don't want to know. Very simple. They just are not interested to know. They're happy where they are. <clears throat> they don't have to think. They don't have to question. They don't have to know. They can just uh, spend all their time watching television, enjoying the basketball game, and they don't need to know until trouble comes. Then when trouble comes in their life, in their marriage, or in their work or something, and now they start questioning you know, the values and start questioning government, well, by that time it's way too late. You should have started questioning a long time ago. So I've come to the point where I realize that most people are not interested to know the truth. Like the movie said, I like, uh, you know, that motion picture where the actor says, you know, you can't handle the truth. And unfortunately, that's that's true. I mean, that's, that's yeah. the bottom line. Yeah, it is. It absolutely is. Um, 
I've uh, I've noticed that. I've noticed that people are just comfortable in their little uh, train of thought and their um, chasing whatever it is that they're chasing. Um, I think I think that uh, a lot of the the people would love they would love to have peace and harmony and uh, and uh, one one sort of religious thought process and everything like that, but they don't give any attention to it. They're too busy, they're distracted, and they're enjoying their distractions, even though their distractions are giving yeah. them, them pain. Because unless you ask these questions, these hard questions, and get answers, um, you, you're just running around in circles and giving yourself pain, are you not? And, yeah, and you're, being, uh, <clears throat> you're being played for a fool. You're being played. Uh, the, the people who know, they know that you don't know. And that's why they're taking advantage of you. They're lying to you. They're tricking you. They're deceiving you into uh, accepting, and, uh, accepting ideas and contracts and concepts, uh, full well knowing that you don't understand and they're just, they're just playing you. And so we call them uh, con men. And, uh, there's a lot of conning going on uh, around the world, and we're finally seeing it now. And finally, even the most ignorant among us are beginning to see that the human world that we live in, that we humans have made for ourselves, is filled with lies, deception, corruption, con artists, especially on the uh, white collar crime, you know, corporations, religions, mm -hmm. churches. I mean, it's everywhere. It's rampant. It's the disease that's killing the human family of the corruption. But uh, yeah. eventually, you know, it'll all collapse when it does. And when it collapses, then people are going to be wandering around aimlessly, wondering, well, what happened? Well, you know, we've been trying to tell you what's happening a long time ago, but nobody was listening. So, yeah, uh, I, you know, and I, I grew up in the, in, in, the, in the shadow of the Catholic Church. As uh, and and I also was interested in the uh, the different paths that you were looking at to the same thing, and we both were coming at the same problem. Uh, I I was doing it back in 1959, 60. That's uh, what 53 years ago, and so it wasn't until I came across uh, the work of Manly Palmer Hall uh, uh, and the late 70s mid to late 70s, uh, that a lot of my answers, a lot of the answers were provided. And from then on, I started uh, into a totally different, um, you know, avenue because uh, from 1959 um, to about the mid 70s, I had been uh, involved in researching and studying the, uh, the movements of these secret societies and fraternal orders and the occult world of power, and uh, quite a few years, and uh, you know, 59, say 60 to 75, that's um, you know, 15, 16 years. I have been day in and day out studying the uh, the works of the secret societies, but only until the time I I really began looking at the uh, Catholic Church and the religions in general, and Christianity in particular. That all of the other materials that I had, I had come across began to make sense because the bottom line in this world is religion. The religions of the of the nations of the of the world are the are the real powers behind government. And the reason why is very simple because in the ancient world, the kings and priests were all almost all the all the ancient peoples. Their kings were priests. Their kings not only represented the government, but they represented the presence of God. And their and their kings were gods, or are felt or are thought to be gods. So uh, you know, religion and and uh, government's always been one and the same thing. My mother used to say that uh, there's never been a religion on the world that, that wasn't a little political. Mm -hmm. There's never been a there's never been a political movement in the world that wasn't a little religious. Yes, religion and politics are one and the same thing. It's the manipulation of the masses of the people for commerce, yeah. for control, whatever it is. 
whatever you're trying to do, if you're trying to take over the world or taking over a country or manipulating commerce or whatever it is you're trying to accomplish, religion and government are the two hands. And the two hands have also are also always being operated by the one brain. And so you know, that's why I, I, you've heard me say probably that in America, we, um, you know, our, our symbol in America, our national symbol is the eagle. Well, eagles only have two wings. They have a left wing and a right wing. And the idea is that there's only two parties available, left wing politics and right wing politics. But like uh, anything else, um, it has a brain in the middle. The brain in the middle for the, in America is the church, uh, especially the, the, the Catholic church. All, I mean, even Washington, D.C. is based off of the ancient Roman Empire. So uh, it's it's an extraordinary story of betrayal, like I said. And yeah. uh, the other thing I would like to say before I forget it is that I really want to thank you for your work because you have saved me a lot of time. Because at seventy one, I just don't have the old stuff anymore to 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 uh, do what you have been able to do. Because I've been looking at it for a long time, but uh, you have concisely explained in detail all the things which I wanted said so I didn't have to do it. And so I, I always point everybody who comes to me, I just send them your uh, your your uh, uh, website and tell them, you know, just go on the web and just listen to him because that's what I'm doing, that's what I've been talking about. He just does it better. So uh, I want to thank you for taking, uh, you know, taking the time to do a great work it's sensational what you've been able to do. Thanks, Jordan. And um, I'm going to return that because um, I want to thank you uh, for my mother, my brother, and my sister and my son. And here's why. <laughs> um, I, too, uh, discovered Manly P. Hall and his um, astrotheological um, audio files. Mm. I have 54 of his audio files, and that's about all I listen to when I go to the city or when I come back or whenever I'm in my car. It's Manly P. Hall and um, and your archives. Now, your archives, <laughs> I've got about 20 or 30 of those. Um, wow. I quickly put yeah, I put them together for my mother, put them on her iPod, did the same for my brother, did the same for my son and my sister because they were very, very slow of learning. Um, and everything I gave them, they couldn't understand or was over their heads. My mother comes back to me and she says, oh, I love Jordan. Oh, I love Jordan. My mother's very emotional. She's um, from Italian Italian descendancy, and she just she just kept singing your praises. I understand him. I don't understand anybody else. I understand Jordan. Then my brother does the same thing. He says, "Oh, mate, I've listened to his audio files three or four times over, and they get better and better every time." My sister, I gave her Manly P. Hall. I gave her Jordan Maxwell. She did not want to listen to Man P. Hall because I couldn't understand right. him. <laughs> well, but she just it. And uh, thank you for it. And, uh, you know, Manly, I, I, I was very close friends with Manly P. Hall. And when he passed away, um, I, I was working in San Diego. And uh, Obadiah Harris, the president of Manly P. Hall's um, research uh, foundation, called me in San Diego. And he said, Jordan, uh, Manly left you a gift. He said that he wanted you to have a gift after he passed away, and so uh, you want to come pick it up. And I said, what is it? And he said, no, I'm not going to tell you. Just come pick it up. Well, I drove up from San Diego that day because I figured any time a master leaves me something, uh, I want to know what it is now. And I got up there, all of his research journals, everything, that he, uh, all of his work, uh, all of his research journals from the day he started, back in 1936, 37, whatever it was, until the day he died, I have, he, he gave it to me. So I have the complete works of Manly Palmer Hall uh, that he gave me as a gift. And uh, Obadiah told me there's only three sets that we know of that are uh, complete sets. And two of them are at the PRS, his, uh, his university. And he said the third one, 
when he gave you. So, you know, I was I was shocked too when I found that um, all of Mr. Hall's personal, uh, you know, journals and and work, he left it to me. Uh, and so, wow. um, yeah, I wow. was just amazed. I couldn't imagine why why would such a great man do that for for me? But uh, yeah. I have him here. I have wow. him here. That's, you're so lucky. I mean, anything that he says is just golden. It's just golden. And I urge the listeners, please, if you really love the, the subject of astrotheology, uh, you can just download his five astrotheological uh, audio files off anywhere on the internet. There's about 10 sites that carry them as far as I know. Um, and on top of that, he has he covers subjects uh, of the Neoplatonists, Proclus, Iamblichus, Plotinus, Porphyry, Julian. He covers um, Eastern uh, philosophy, Buddhic, the Buddhic system, uh, human love, love of beauty, love of God, love of truth, the power of redemption, etc., etc. These are just titles that I'm flicking through on uh, on iTunes. But I have 54 of his audio fi audio files and. Um, I'm so thankful to have them. Uh, listeners, let's go to a break. We have some music. Uh, thanks, Jordan. Uh, how are you? Jordan, um, <clears throat> I do have two of your books. I've got um, the book your church doesn't want you to read, and that is a bigger one of the two. The other one is that old-time religion, story of religious foundations. Now, both of these books are gems. They are absolute gems for researchers if you're a researcher out there you must you must read these two books and in particular probably out of the two i would say the one that opens your mind to the deception would be the book your church doesn't want you to read now there's quite, quite a few contributors here uh you've got steve allen dan barker ed Dor, Stephen Hola, who is a great researcher, um, and there's many more, Robert Eisenman, but um, and and Jordan, of course, you're here. There's about uh, ten ten contributors, and look, I'll tell you what: if you don't read this book, <laughs> this book is just a gem. Um, there's there's it's all. Um, in little small chapters, so you get little little chunks of great reading from all the different contributors. And Stephen Hola has contributed a portion there, the chapter Hermes versus the Puritans. I urge people to read that, and um, it talks about how we can save our hermetic origins of the founding of, of this uh, wonderful com country, which is the United States of America. People, when you hear it really irritates me, Jordan, when you hear people, uh, churchgoers, saying, oh, we need to bring our country back to our Christian original uh, traditions and the, and, and the founding of this wonderful, great country. It was anything but Christian, was it not? Yeah, I know. It was from the, the Christian movement in Europe that the American fathers are, were fleeing. They were, they were coming here to get away from the Vatican, to get away from religion. And uh, that's the whole reason why they came to the, the new land, is to get away from the tyranny, the absolute criminal tyranny that was going on in, uh, in Europe. And I've been asked in the past, how did the Catholic Church get to be so big and so powerful? Uh, obviously, God is with the church because it got to be so big. I said, no, it got to be large because they would kill you if you didn't join. And so you'd be surprised how large your organization can get if you're ruthless enough to roam around and kill people who don't join. Uh, and before you know it, I mean, there are all kinds of people be happy to join. And so that's how they got to be so big. It was because it was an incredible Roman operation that was taking over Europe. And as I've said, you know, the, Europe has been dominated for almost 2,300 years by Rome starting with the Roman Empire and in the last 1,600 years dominating uh, dominating Europe uh, and the Vatican. So, and of course, for 2,300 years, Europe has dominated the planet. So, you know, all roads lead to Rome. You can go back into history and Rome was, was, um, was dominating the whole world of its time 
And today, Rome still dominates the world through Europe and through the church and through all of the, you know, all the secret societies and fraternal orders, banking institutions. And it's quite an interesting story about the history of the Roman church. And, uh, and of course, the Protestant church is not 10 cents better because it's, it came out of, it's one of the offspring of the Roman church. And so while I have the highest respect for the Bible, I have the highest respect for the words that are attributed to Jesus in the Bible, I don't have any problem with any of that. I, I think it's probably the most important words, the most important concepts ever, uh, ever given to mankind. Uh, my problem mm -hmm. is with organized corporate religion and the, and the secret orders of, uh, of philosophy and and uh, tyranny and commerce that the church represents. That's what my problem is. I don't have any problem with God. It's with man. And so, yeah. it, it's, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a very deep subject, and most people are not interested to do that much research on it. But, boy, when you do and you begin to see how, it's a really quite a story. When you begin to see how this country was founded, how America was founded, what happened to the uh, the people who found this country and and the the hidden symbolism of the of the country and where it came from and how the church was involved uh, it's an extraordinary story and, and there's a whole big story going on that most people will never hear concerning the Vatican and the British royalty and how the British royalty are nothing more than a front for the Vatican and um, so this is the kind of stuff I've been talking about for years, and it's only because of your work has, has really nailed it down into details. And that's the thing, I, I, I again, I'm saying I, I don't have the time or the, or the wherewithal to, uh, to take the time uh, to go through all of the minute details of how this stuff happened. But you've done that for me, so again, I'm thanking you for that. And, it's all right there in history. I mean, nobody has uh, nobody has a reason for saying they didn't know, especially today with the technology that exists. I mean, you know, you can, at the tip of your fingers, you can find out anything you want on radio, television, on 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 the uh, you know videos and audio tapes and and digital communication. And today, with the it's so easy to find out anything. We are the most ignorant we've ever been. So uh, it's because people don't want to know again. And uh, But I, I've watched the, the movements of the international banking cartels and what's going on in Europe today and then the stranglehold that the uh, secret societies have on the earth itself. I mean, even Australia, New Zealand, there's a lot of dark stuff going on uh, to rape and plunder the country and the people and destroy the, the freedom and destroy the humanity and bring the whole world onto its knees. So, and all of this can be traced back to Rome. It can all be traced back to the secret societies coming out of Europe. And this is what the founding fathers of America were trying to get away from. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, and, and I, I, the the guy who was the uh, editor for the the book your church doesn't want you to read was Tim Leadham, and Tim one time said to me, and just in passing, but it sounded funny at the time. But he said, "Can you imagine if the Illuminati who run this world, if if that power was taken away from them, the absolute sovereign power to control the the lives of humans on the earth that they are exerting." And if you took that power away from the secret, the Illuminati, and gave it to the Christians and let them run the earth, can you imagine what this world would be like? And uh, I never thought about it like that. Because, my God, I mean, there's, uh, all the wars of Europe have been over religion. And all the three great, I mean, the two greatest wars on the earth were fought inside of Christendom, right in Germany, right in Europe, in Christendom. So, um, you know, this is what the Christian heritage that we have today, which has nothing to do with the original Christianity and the original concepts coming out of the, out of the ancient world, uh, but, the, you know, the, the, 
thing that we call the Christian religion today gave us two world wars and all the stuff that's going on today. You know, uh, George Bush was talking about he talks to God, and that's why he can uh, you know, waterboard and torture people and and throw them into prisons and cut the fingers off and torture, you know, because the Lord talked to him. And uh, that's the same thing that the Pope was doing in the Middle Ages. And it's with the inquisitions and so i you know the, the founding fathers were not only christian they were deists if anything and uh, they had a high respect for spirituality and for the concept and idea of a divine presence in the universe but but um christianity as in a matter of fact was not very well looked upon in, uh, in the founding of this country. Thank God, because we would be even worse off than we are now. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I would like to uh, give some support to that. Uh, John Adams, when he signed the Treaty of Tripoli in Article 11, uh, it states, uh, the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. There you go. Right. Now, Julian, Julian the Emperor, uh, 1,600 years ago, the nephew of Constantine, who brought back, brought Rome back to its original ancient religions, uh, he said in his book uh, Against the Galileans, he said, um, you yourselves behave like the Jews who vent their rage and petulance by raising altars and destroying temples, and you slaughter us as well speaking about the Christians uh, slaughtering um, the uh, so-called pagans. Yeah. Not, only those, not only those of us who remain true to the teachings of our ancestors, but even your own, or those who you style heretics because you do not bewail, they do not bewail a corpse in the manner your teachers demand. These are your deeds. Nowhere did Jesus or Paul pass on rules for such actions. And why? Because never they have imagined that their followers would have such power as they have now. That's it. Uh, yeah, that's what he said. He said that 1,600 years ago, Jordan. He said never would he have imagined that his followers, so-called, would have so much power as that go around destroying temples, killing people at the edge of a sword for not converting to their religion, etc. So um, um, you just well, got to wonder. That right. As a matter yeah. of fact, you know, uh, as a matter of fact, you know, the, the very word pagan, you know, the Christians love to call people a non-Christian pagan. The very word pagan uh, comes from an old, um, from the old days and from the old world. A world. The word pagan simply means someone who lives in the mountain areas or someone who lives in the outland. So the idea was is that when Christianity uh, was uh, finally officially put into place by Constantine um, and and uh, fourth century. Uh, anyone who was uh, in in government, the end thing to be would be a Christian, because the emperor is now a Christian, and so now it's the end thing to do, because the president goes to church. Well, everybody else needs to go to church also. And so it was a political thing. It was just good to be a Christian, uh, uh, the way Constantine understood it. And so anyone out in the you know, out in the in the farmlands and uh, hundreds or thousands of miles away from Rome were not invited into the inner circle. And so they were called. The, the word was a pagan. Simply means people who don't live in the city, the farmers and the people, the poor people out there working. Who have been here for thousands of years, uh, doing their, doing what they do. They are pagans. They don't know. Uh, they're not in with the in crowd in Rome. Yeah. And so uh, that's that's where the word pagan uh, came from. So yep, pagans absolutely. today would be just a regular, ordinary people who have not heard about your thing bat religion. You know. Mm, yeah. Tell me, so, Jordan. Uh, where do you? Where do you think most of the money is coming from to keep these these corp incorporated churches going? Tavistock, um, obviously well, they're in you know, there. The oil companies are one of the main suppliers of the funds for Christian uh, missionaries around the world. 
um, yeah. indiscriminately of any particular um, you know of, uh, church, but almost all Protestant uh, churches around the world are getting money from the oil companies to uh, to finance their missionaries. There's a book out, a very large book. I don't know how many hundreds of pages it is. It's a very big book called uh, Thy Will Be Done. Came out, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago. Thy Will Be Done. And it's like six different authors. And what they've done is they have documented page by page, <clears throat> footnoted, all of the different churches around the, around the world that are being financed by the oil corporations, how much money each one's getting, where the money was put, <clears throat> and what it's being used for. And so in that book, they, they showed that the oil companies loved the idea of Christian missionaries. That's a big thing with the oil companies, because the Christian missionaries will go in, uh, supposedly representing God, <clears throat> and begin to teach the people about God and to accept the the, the primacy of the Pope and of uh, religion and the Holy uh, the Holy Father. And once you can get the people, you know, under under that mentality, then you can start moving in on their <clears throat> uh, social arrangements, and then ultimately into the political. And finally, the corporations can move in, take over the land, and now they've got you. But you started with something nice and pretty, like a, like the, like the church. So, Good, excellent. Uh, let's, let's be done. Yeah, let's um, let's come back to this thought. We'll go to a break because I I like this one. Are you self special guest Jordan Maxwell? Now this is our last uh, segment with Jordan. Uh, at the top of the hour, Jordan will have to uh, leave, and then I'll just uh, continue on after that. So um, we're very privileged to have Jordan, and uh, I thank you very much for uh, joining with us, uh, Jordan. Uh, before the break, you were talking about the book, Thy Will Be Done, The Quest of the Amazon. Now, this is the subtitle, The Quest of the Amazon, and then it goes on to have another, seemingly another uh subtitle and it's Nelson Rockefeller and Evangelism in the Age of Oil. Now, this is not the first time that uh, anyone has suspected the Rockefellers or the Rothschilds of pumping in massive amounts of money to keep these churches going. In fact, when I was Jehovah's Witness, I discovered that the Roth the, the Rothschilds and B'nai B'rith were pumping in massive doses of money at the beginning when Charles Taze Russell was kicking around to support that particular organisation. That's the one I came from. Now, there's uh, there's thousands of these so-called bloodletting Christian churches that are being propped up and, and um, supported by these uh, multinational organisations and um yeah, the elite families that control them, etc. They love these so-called Christian churches. They love them. That's why they support them, because it creates, like kindergarten and the educational system, dumbed-down, obedient workers. In fact, the Jehovah's Witnesses used to boast in the Watchtower magazine that the government recognised them in every country where they are that they are the best tax-paying citizens on, on the planet. How's that? Uh, Santos, back in, uh, oh, I guess it's the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, um, I was um, at one of the big uh, conferences of Jehovah's Witnesses here in Los Angeles, and I knew the, a couple of the members of the governing body at that time. And so they all went out to dinner. All the, uh, There were three different members of the governing body, plus uh, the chief financial officer for the Watchtower Bible Tract Society. And they were going out to dinner with some of the other officials, and I was invited. And, uh, and so at dinner... It was in Woodland Hills at a place called Victoria Station, right across the street from one of the big centers 
uh, conference centers for Jehovah's Witnesses. And at dinner, they were sitting around talking, uh, uh, you know, religion, etc. And but there was a young man there. He was a Greek, and um, he was the chief financial officer for the Watchtower Society. And I pointedly asked him over the dinner table. I asked him. I said, well, you know, I know that the Watchtower Society is spending hundreds of millions a year uh, in their building projects alone. And the Watchtower has actually said in their publications that in that particular year, I was talking to him, the Watchtower has said that they had spent $66 million in salaries alone, not to, not to include the buying of properties and building uh, you know, building buildings around the world and printing presses and God knows what else, but sixty-six million just in salaries for construction crews and for all kinds of uh, reasons around the earth. And so I asked him, I said, "Where in the world is the Watchtower Society getting that kind of money?" Because the generally speaking, the people, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, are just working class people. Uh, who have vir virtually nothing, where are they getting that kind of money? And he said to me, in front of the three members on the governing body sitting there, he said, we have an open-end corporate account with Morgan Guarantee Trust of Philadelphia and Chase Manhattan Bank of New York. And so I said, what does that mean, open-end corporate account? He said, basically... Uh, once a year, we get a checkbook from each one of those banks, and whatever we write, it's covered, period. Whatever it is that we write, it's covered. Yep. And I thought to myself, well, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Guarantee Trust, is a division of the Rothschild Bank in England. I mean, everybody, you can trace that down uh, easy. So the Rothschilds of England were financing on an open-end account with the Watchtower Society and the Morgan Guarantee Trust, as I said, connected to Rothschilds, and then, of course, Chase Manhattan is Rockefeller. And this is what the, uh, this is what the young man told me. We have open-end corporate accounts with Chase Manhattan and uh, Morgan Guarantee Trust of Philadelphia, which means we write any check for whatever the amount is covered. But what is that all about? Well, I, mean, I, I, I think that should tell you something. And, yeah, uh, well, look. And, and, and we had some really interesting conversations that night because there were all three of the members of the governing three three of the members of the governing body was there, and one of them actually told me because I was talking, I was asking a lot of questions, and uh, and one of them in particular knew me from uh, from years before, and he said to me in front of everyone, he said, Jordan. You are viewing the world from a, from midday uh, with the light on everything, but Jehovah's Witnesses are they're, they're still in the dark on a lot of things, and so it might be better for you, you know, to curb your enthusiasm, so to speak, and uh, just you know, mind what you're saying, be quiet, because uh, because you're going to cause a lot of trouble for yourself. And for the organization, because uh, you know you're seeing things that you're not supposed to see, and you're asking questions that are going to be very difficult to answer. So, you know, it was a polite way of saying, why don't you just uh, keep your mouth shut and, and go along with the program? So, I pretty yeah. well figured out what was going on there, and I've got a lot of other stuff that uh, about Jehovah's Witnesses that you and I could talk about for hours. I mean, the mere fact that Charles Tess Russell in his very first Watchtower. Back in 1870s, because 1871, whatever it was, uh, and his very first watchtower talked about how there was going to be a communist revolution in Russia, which was about 36 years before it happened. And the watchtower said there will be a communist revolution, and it will happen in Russia. And I thought that's interesting because when the when the revolution happened. He said it would happen after 1914, and when it did happen in 1916, after 1914, it was called a Bolshevik Revolution. And it was only a couple of years later, after Kerensky was, was ousted of the Bolshevik Revolution, that Lenin called it a Communist Revolution. That's exactly what Charles Tess Russell had said back in 1870. 
that it would be called a communist revolution. And so, you know, you've got to figure out what is that all about? Charles Tess Russell accurately called it a communist revolution some 30 some odd years before it ever even happened. And then you find out that the last, then you find out the last communist international uh, meeting was held in Allegheny, Pennsylvania. The last official communist uh, meeting of world communism in its formation was held in Allegheny, Pennsylvania in 1870s. Well, that's where Charles Tess Russell was from, Allegheny, Pennsylvania in 1870s. That's right. Yep. You know, there's a lot of stuff here people don't know about about the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, Christian, Christadelphians, Worldwide Church of God. All of these are, are very well connected behind the scenes to international banking cartels, Knights Templars. Quite a story, once you finally begin to see it. Yeah, and this is what I'm trying to reach out to people, especially churchgoers, to see. That the churches are not what they say they are. And the nope. stuff that I'm presenting, and of course you, is the real Christianity. The That's science right. of light. That's the one that has been oppressed and uh, and suppressed. And the ones teaching it are the ones being persecuted. That's the true Christianity. The right. occult science. <laughs> You're right, um, but that's what... Isn't that what the Bible has Jesus saying? You know, the slave is no greater than the master. What they've done to me, they will do to you. And so, uh, you know, so that's exactly right, because Jesus represents the truth and the light. And so whatever happened to I've been saying this for years, that the story in the New Testament story about Jesus is a metaphor. It's a symbolic story. Jesus represents the truth and the light. So whatever happens to Jesus is what happens to the truth and the light. And whatever Jesus said, that's what the truth and the light would say. And whatever and whatever the truth and whatever Jesus did, that's what the truth and the light would do. And so, if you're looking at the New Testament as a metaphor, a symbolic story, Jesus represents the truth and the light, and his adversary in this world is the Prince of Darkness. You know, and the Prince of Darkness was set, and that's why it gets dark at sunset. I mean, when you begin to break all of this down, you begin, you know, you'll, you'll see it overwhelmingly obvious that um, the religion is simply organized crime at its highest order. It's, it's Absolutely. Story. And, well, Jordan, well, we've I come to the end. Going to be going, so I'm, I want to say too that on my home page of jordanmaxwell.com, there are four books uh, on the home page. Uh, highly recommended books. These are e-books. You can download them quickly. All four of them are, are monumental works that you really need to get uh, because they're extraordinarily interesting and important books. Those are the four most important books in my mind, so that's why I put them on my home page. You can just download them yourself. So um, I want to thank you for allowing me to be on the show. And I would like love to do more with you, and, and uh, if you're coming here, please contact me when you get here. Will do. Thank you, Jordan. And um, I'm sure the pre- uh, listeners are very appreciative. Now you and your family and friends.